All right, welcome everyone. We've got our Loan Desk weekly session in rooms today. And so we're gonna be kicking off the call with a rocket training. Um, and this one's gonna be on the 10 essentials of a purchase sale. So um, I'm gonna hand things over to Joel. He will um, go ahead and start the video shortly. All right. We're gonna go back and forth a lot, Christina and I, really having uh, a great time describing different philosophies. And this is something, Christine, that I say all the time. Uh, sales is all about getting people to think differently, about getting people to think about things that they weren't thinking about. And that's exactly what we're gonna focus on today. So remember, it's not about semantics. You gotta be you. You're a great mortgage pro because of who you are. But if we're able to give you a few different ideas to apply in some structure and process that's exactly what we're all looking for so christine let's start with a, a little bit of fun here let's go into a question for the group so we got a couple of pictures that we're going to pose for you put them on the screen there's a and there's b on the right hand side question yeah. you're going to answer everybody else is thinking about this but which one of these would help a child understand and commit to long-term memory touching the hot stove or maybe having a conversation about not touching the stove. Which are you? I would probably say, you know, although I listened to my parents and my mom, it was just something about really experiencing certain things for myself. So I might fall in that B category. Curi the curiosity got me into that B category quite a bit sometimes. <laughs> Adventurous. Okay. All right. I bet there's a lot of folks out there right now nodding their heads and going, yeah, me too. I'm absolutely the doer. Um, I would probably say I'm maybe a mix of both. And there's a lot of folks that are feeling that same way too. I, I, you know, I'm a little bit of balance of both, but I definitely understand the idea behind when you do something, it's that whole self-discovery piece. You yeah. do something, you get the experience of doing it. It is much more impactful and long lasting with you when you do something as opposed to talking to somebody about something. So let's use that. We're gonna we're gonna use that through the entire training as we go through. Write that down for yourself. Self discovery, the most important piece of creating that buying experience for a client is being able to have them experience self discovery. So, let's talk about the roadmap, Christine. Can you tell us here from an outcome standpoint? We got some outcomes. Where are we gonna go with this training? Yes, first and foremost, we want you to be able to really convince your clients that you are the choice. You are the one that they will want to work with and also refer. Then you're going to educate really the clients on the differences. You want to really show them the difference to make sure that they understand that they have options. And lastly, control. So Mike, we want to make sure that we are really messaging them with the right information before they hang up that phone. I like what you said there about the control. So you're really speaking to me as a sales pro, like I wanna try to control as much as I possibly can and control having a great experience. So uh, we've got our three buckets, the things that we're going to hit. We're gonna be talking through 10 specific essentials and the beautiful piece, Christine, while we were preparing for this, they all flow into one another. Like each one of these, as we go through, you're gonna see that each one really plays well off of another. Um, so let's start. If you've got a pen and paper, we're going to have you write down a couple of things, but we're going to get first a little bit personal again with you. I'm going to go back out to you. Everyone out there, I want you to think about this question. Did you or someone you know, <laughs> were, th were you or someone you know a diligent note taker in school? Think about that for a second. And if so, why? Now I'm going to ask you, Christine, because you're the voice of the people right now. Yes. Were you or were you not? I was the diligent note taker. I had to write everything down so that I could really best learn the information that I was studying in school. And that way I can refer back to it. I can highlight certain areas, things that really stood out to me or that was important. I used that. I had to write it down, highlight and all. All right, you'd be my best friend in school, actually, because I was probably more, especially early on in my college days, was more of the like the sit and like observe and learn. It took me a while to get the pen. It took me a while to like write things down. Uh, so I think over time I learned that I need to be doing it that way, but you would have been my best friend because what I found is that without taking diligent notes or without engaging pen and paper, what would happen is I'd end up going to someone like Christine and going, hey, real quick, I had a question for you. <laughs> and then I'd be looking at your notes and your outline because 
I agree with you. It really is the best way to learn information. Um, I would forget things. This helps you not forget. It helps control the focus. It's really an engaging piece. So with that being said, we're going to get into our first, the first essential. It's called the power of the pen. Now, when it comes to the power of a pen, it's arguable, Christine. What is the most impactful or most valuable tool that we have as a sales professional? I would argue that the pen is one of those. Uh, what are your thoughts, though? I think really the most valuable, uh, the pen definitely is valuable, but really those notes to me, when you use that pen to take notes, write things down, you can actually refer back to them. You can connect with your client in certain ways. You can connect with the real estate agent if there's things that you know about that transaction. So it's very important to really do digital or whether they're handwritten. All right. So the group's getting the feeling already. You're like, that was a good check on me because you're right. If a pen just sits there and it's not taking the notes, the notes, the engagement is ultimately the piece that you want to have. And we have two bullets on the screen. This is what we would ask you to focus on. How can you harness the client's focus? You have them write things down. For you to disseminate information from your head and all of your experience as a mortgage pro to your client into their head and down onto the paper, that's ultimately what you're looking to do. You're looking to better control the outcome. Also, for those folks that are like, you know what, I want to be able to engage the, the real estate professional, the real estate agent. A lot of the things that we're going to cover today are going to talk about, hey, what did you tell the client? What did you have the client write down to tell their real estate agent? The point of the matter here, you got to have them write it down. That's the first and foremost piece. And I think, Christine, this ties in so well with the next piece. You know, if from a sales aspect, if I just tell you, Christine, now write this down for me. That's very direct. That's very, you know, there's a lot of control involved with that. But remember, the experience is all about how the client feels. That self-discovery we were talking about before. Yeah. Self-discovery. How do we get them to have the self-discovery? I would advise with essential number two the permission slip. Now for the permission slip, do you mind playing the role of my client on this one, Christine? Sure. All right, perfect. Now, remember, semantics are not what we're here to talk about. You as a mortgage professional, do this however you'd like, but I'm telling you there's a lot of value early on in a relationship with the client to ask them for permission. So it sounds something like this. Christine, I have a lot of thoughts here. I've got some professional opinions. Um, and I'd love to be on the same page with you uh, for a few of these things, but I don't want to be rude. You know, is it, are you comfortable if I ask you to write a couple things down that I think are very important for you? Sure. Sure. Let me just grab a pen. Wonderful. Okay. So asking for permission, how many people out of 10 are going to say yes, then no problem. What are your thoughts? I would really probably say nine out of 10. And then that one person that's not maybe because they're driving and they can't or but okay. other than that, most times people will, they all agree. Right. So again, remember this is no silver bullets, but I, I think that it feels good when somebody asks you for permission for something. So for those folks out there that are like, Hey, how do I make my client feel good, feel engaged? I don't want them to feel like I'm barking orders at them or ultimately controlling everything. I want my client to feel like they're going on an experience. Part of that, very simple, ask for the permission slip up front. Once you've got the permission, I think you're right, Christine. Nine out of 10 people are probably going to say, no problem. Yeah, hold on. Let me grab a pen and paper. And then now they've given you essentially permission to disseminate information to them that's logical and that's useful for building your sale. So again, the power of the pen, make sure you get the permission slip as we go through it. Here's a word track for you so you guys can see you know, a, a version of what I said there. But again, it, it goes back to now that I have a conversation with you, Christine, and now that I'm like, I know that you're armed, you have a pen and paper, and that I have your permission to start to talk about things on a professional level with the purchase transaction, you're much more engaged, just like you were in school. You're like, all right, my notes, let me get to it. So this is going to transition us into number three. We call it reduced to the ridiculous. Now, Christine, I said this earlier. What are your thoughts on, on we have this on the left side of the screen, what sales is truly about? What are your thoughts? Yeah, so as you can see here, just really getting that client to really think about something that they don't already know, or maybe they didn't 
think of it from the viewpoint yeah. that you're going to share with them. That's really the main things because you're going to be listening to certain things, pulling certain things out, and you can bring to light things that they may not have really considered. Absolutely. Things that are intriguing. You know, like uh, our role as a sales professional is to get people to think about things that they probably weren't thinking about. And let's face it, most folks aren't like so in tune with mortgages and how they work or finances in general. We have a lot of financial literacy in our country. So you play an incredible, incredibly important role in helping educate that. So let's talk about reduce to the ridiculous. Uh, the third piece, taking real life examples and making them incredibly easy for your client and having them write it down. Here's a couple of examples. The first one, talking to a client about the fact that $1,000 in a loan amount is the equivalent of about five to six dollars a month. And Christine, when you think about that, like add a zero to it, right? You get so many folks that are looking at buying homes and they're either they have to bid more or they're looking and they're terrified about going outside their budget. If we take that across ten thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars is only a difference in payment of about fifty five dollars a month. Doesn't that feel so much more? Like, oh, that's not so scary. 10,000 sounds scary to me. Yes. But I, I know you have you have thoughts as well on this. So please, sorry. Yes, and I agree. You think about that as your clients really start looking for a home, going out. If you're showing them the differences between the two here, of course, $1,000 is not really that big of a difference. But when you think about it, if they have a home that they either end up having to pay $10,000 more, their first thought is, oh my God. $10,000, that's going to be a lot of money. But when you break it down, it'll only cost 53 additional dollars to get that dream home or that home that you really, really want to purchase. But you thought that 10000 would really put it outside of your realm as far as a payment. But breaking it mm -hmm. down really makes it make a lot more sense, Mike. Yeah, that's, that's the point uh, with reduce to the ridiculous is it, it's so true that as human beings, things that we don't know or understand are scary to us. And a lot of people don't want to admit that, but that's the absolute truth. And we work in the industry. So we're like, yeah, that makes sense financially. I'm, I'm, I'm with you on it. But to your client, that can feel like a lot. That could, this could be something that makes me go, I, I want to wait, I'll, hold on. I want to let things sink because I don't understand that. I'm scared of them a little bit if I'm the client. So if you're taking the power of the pen, you're, you've got permission. Now you can actually start to, Again, disseminate information that's very valuable to the client having a great experience and getting them to think about things differently than they were prior. Keeping that in mind, let's move into number four here. Talking about getting people to think differently, we're going to talk a little bit about the idea of 20% down versus maybe going 15% down with lender paid mortgage insurance. Now, just teeing that up, Christine, I'm, it makes me makes me think the client goes, what the hell is LPMI? What, that, what does this mean? What is that? If you're not building the trust to help really educate them on these things, that could be a tough, it could be a tough sell, right? Yes. But let's, let's give the number breakdown. And in this scenario, I think what we're trying to do, Christine, is, is to paint the idea in a purchase transaction my experience has been a lot of clients want to bring as little money to the table as possible, but they are conditioned to go, I got to put 20% down though, right? Like yes. that's kind of like the ante to play. Either people are, I need to put 20% down or I don't want to put anything down. But either way, people are concerned about doing it the right way. Has that right. been your experience? Too? Okay. Yes. Um, so we're going to break this down for you with an example of a $300,000 purchase. Looking at uh, looking at the mathematics on this, what we're really doing is I priced this out about three weeks ago, 20% down on the left side of the screen versus 15% down in LPMI with a two-point buy-down. So two points on, on, uh, on the loan size, uh, that would give you the, the breakdown monetarily. But there's a difference if we look at how much we're financing. So if we're financing a different amount of money, the right side of the screen is going to look different. That means that we're putting $15,000 less down. That's $15,000, Christine, that the client could potentially keep. Now, I'm going, to, I'm going to communicate with the client that the best thing that we could possibly do if we do go the 15% with the LPMI is that I'm going to invest in the interest rate. 
So we're buying two points. That's why you see the $4,500. And then the LPMI aspect is about $1,500. All in all, that's six grand. There's $9,000 left. Christine, you, you've been a real estate professional. How many discussions have you had with clients and what did they want to do to the home when they were looking at it that they could use $9,000? The first thing in a lot of cases is change the paint, carpet, <laughs> flooring, <laughs> something along those lines. I've had clients say, you know, I don't want to get that house because it needs, I need to paint the kitchen. I don't like the paint. I don't like the color of the wall. So now that they have money left over, they can renovate. They can paint the walls their favorite color. <laughs> The pink bathroom. Everybody know. I know why it's an epidemic, but like my best friend just bought a house and it's got pink toilet, pink tile on the wall, pink, you know, it's everything pink or it's mint. You, you see this a lot, but I think you're right. That keeps clients from feeling confident in saying, I'm going to buy this house and I can see it already. I'm going to change it. I'm going to upgrade it. But they're thinking about how do I do that monetarily? Now you're showing them a different aspect. The best part to me is that investing in the interest rate, we're half a percent less in interest rate in this example, yet the payment, look at that payment, Christine. I mean, you're yeah. talking about less than five bucks. Right. Less than $5. However, in speaking to a client as well, grab your pen and paper, right? Write this down. Over the long haul, this would save you over $13,500 over the, the life of the loan. And that... I don't know how you feel. I'm not super big on like life of the loan. I am big uh, on the one year, five year, 10 year, because I think that's more digestible for a client, but you can't argue with the facts. Like it's providing that same level of, all right, I'm comfortable with the payment because it's within $5, but good Lord, what can I do with the $9,000 to your point? Yes, that's uh, great. I love this example, Mike. It's just, it's so good because it points out a couple of things. One, when you talk about PMI, it makes a difference in the payment for the client. They have more money in their pocket. They're saving. This isn't obvious, but the client now has that choice in front of them. And they're going to go with the obvious one that looks the best. That's going to save them more, allow them to keep money in their pocket. In this example, the rate was lower. Mm. So there were so many wins for the client. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take something that you just said and ask everyone to write that down. Please write down flexibility. I just wrote it down to flexibility. We're going to talk a lot about that as we go through. One of the things that a real estate professional loves to hear is we have flexibility. <laughs> the client has flexibility with what we can do. Like, okay, we're not pigeonholed. This is not something that if somebody sneezes, the loan's going to fall out. That's a good thing. Can we talk for a second, Christine, about the folks that would really probably be the best candidates for something like 15% down plus LPMI? Really, I think in this example, there you have that client. If they're looking to purchase a home and they know that, you know, that home is going to need some updates. So there's things that they know that they really have to, that, you know, they may go into a home and they see those updates. Because we've given them the option, then they know, okay, I have the ability to take care of those updates. Then you also may have that client that would really like to really liquidate all of their savings. And they, I'm just going to put everything in. I've been saving for this. I want to spend everything. But now they've erased yeah. possibly that safety net for themselves. So you really have to know your client and being able to really get them to think about things that they may not have considered. Oh, yeah, you're so right. The, the idea when people go all in, like I'm buying a house, I'm all chips into the middle, right? They do that and they're not thinking about the safety net. They're not thinking about, well, I feel like every time something happens in my house, it's two grand out the window. Like anything happens at my house, $2,000 is pretty much what I'm, you know, I'm going to have to do. Um, so for folks that are liquidating all their savings for the down payment or to get involved in the purchase of it, what a great feeling for them to be able to have a different option, have that flexibility that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. Now, we didn't really even get into this, so I'll, I'll just, I'll kindly ask all of our mortgage pros that are here today to consider this as well, the, the, the PMI rates that we have. If you do go with PMI, like there's just so many options and clients are, are really laser focused on, this is what I think I have to do because this is what I've been told by others. They have not worked with a mortgage professional like yourself that can help them become educated. Hence, again, the power of the pen, getting permission, and then being able to help educate. If you're walking away from this slide with one thing, we want it to be that you can 
do winning. You can win. Sometimes alternate thinking or alternative thinking is the way of, hey, have you thought about this? Which is an incredible segue, actually, for our fifth essential, the did you know. Now, I say this, Christine, I say, did you know? And I see videos on this stuff all the time, like, hey, did you know? Why does did you know pull us in as human beings? When everybody says, hey, did you know? Like, I lean in on that. I don't understand that. Yes, you really stop to listen. That, that It's like, okay, if I did know, I really need to tune in and really listen because I want to know. Yeah, like, oh, you got my ear. Like, I want to know, right? But we're going to go back to, again, the idea of the client having that self-discovery. So we don't want a client to feel like we're, we're, you know, pointing out things like, hey, you don't know this. I know this because I'm the pro. You don't know this. We want them to feel like they're right where they're supposed to be. So to do this, um, I would recommend a couple things. Do you mind playing uh, the role of my client, Christine? Sure, I will. All right, perfect. So if I had information like what we were talking about a couple slides ago, the whole um, the idea of $10,000 is about $50 a month. I would take that information and how I would frame from a sales aspect, how I would frame that information is with a polite foreshadow. It might sound something similar to this. Hey, Christine, may I, may I share something with you that a lot of my clients don't think about? Yes, sure. All right, perfect. Now, did you know that $10,000 borrowed is really the equivalent of about $50 a month in your payment. Most sure. people don't know that. I, I, I would ask you to write that down. It's something very good for you to think about as you're looking at all these different homes in the area that you're looking within. Now, I don't want, again, I didn't want Christine to feel like I was telling her, Christine, you don't know this stuff, so let me just tell you. I use that bandwagon approach of saying, a lot of clients don't know this. Can I share this with you? Got her permission? Yes gave it to her and asked her to write it down. That's how I ensure that she's got it and she's thinking about it. Now, there are other pieces that we've talked about, Christine, right? We've talked about this on the other slides. Did you also know, because a lot of people think you have to put 20% down, uh, that you don't have to. There's a lot of options out there. Also, some clients are, are very payment sensitive and they find that using $1,000 and using that as a benchmark, $1,000 is $5 a month in mortgage payment. So if you would write that down for yourself, $1,000, $5 a month, that's a great way to consider any financing option that you're looking at when you're exploring options within a mortgage. Um, I would also ask you to, to like make it a little note here to yourself that this is something that you're probably going to want to speak to your real estate agent about. The real estate agent really likes to know that you have flexibility. And the good news for you, Christine, is you do. You have flexibility in the things that we're talking about today. And then I would round it out with this last piece. Did you get all that down or did you miss any part of that, Christine? I got everything down. Like, yes, it's great. Great. And then we would pivot away, like move on. Again, this is bite-sized increments of educating the client, but getting them to feel good. Now I'm going to ask the, the group a question. I want you to think about this. I'm obviously going to go out to you, Christine, because you're the voice of the people. But just thinking about this, why would we want to establish this type of logic with a client? Well, it's so important, Mike, because specifically we want to make sure that the client understands that they have options and they have a, a multiple things that they can do. They have that flexibility. They, When they work with their real estate agent, they want them to know that they're really able to do different things as far as their payment. Maybe they are going to have to get a home that either costs a little more or a little less, but it's really, they're really thinking about different options so that they're more mm. equipped to find that dream home. Yes, options. I wrote that down because you said it. options. I drew a line to flexibility. Options are the spice of life. Options are the spice of life. When people understand that they have options, their confidence in, in working with you really does grow because it's not about like a matter of this is the program. You have to do it this way. It's about working together to, def to define what makes the most sense for the family. Mm -hmm. And that is so critical on a purchase transaction because now you're talking about lifelong clients because of that first experience as well as a referral network. Um, and I don't, I'm going to go back to something here with number six. We mentioned in this, this last tip, number five, we said, Hey, you don't want to make sure you mention that to your, to your real estate agent that you have flexibility. I don't ever assume anything in sales. 
I will give direction to my client, but I also believe in process. So when we move into number six here, the real estate agent call, I believe that this is one of the, the easiest to implement, but it's one of the things that like you really have to honor your process. So in talking about process, Christine, listen to lots, lots of phone calls, okay. you know, with our, our mortgage pros. Um, and here's the way that I typically hear this. Do you mind playing the role of a real estate agent? Okay. Okay. We're going to act like um, we have a mutual client, Zach. Zach is our client. Okay. And I, I was talking to Zach and I told Zach, Hey, make sure you're telling Christine that you have flexibility. This is what I would normally hear from a mortgage pro when they call the real estate agent to do an intro call. Ring, ring. Hello, this is Christine. Hey, Christine, this is Mike Bud calling from Bud Mortgage. Uh, I'm giving you a phone call because we have a mutual client, Zach, that I I'm working with and I wanted to call and introduce myself. How have you been? I've been great. Thank you. Thank you for calling me. Wonderful. Yeah, I, I, you know, it's important that uh, I reach out to you. I'd love to continue to work with you. And I, I also want to make sure that, you know, if you need anything that I'm here for you throughout the transaction, um, I'd like to uh, make sure that I have great relationships with the real estate agents that I work with. Um, it, you know, and so if you you have anybody that, you know, that you think would benefit in working with me, by all means, I, I, I'd love to, you know, work with any of your clients and scene. like that's literally how it goes. There's good aspects. And then there's aspects that are, I don't know, like, I don't know. Have I earned the right right now to go in and ask you, Christine, for some referrals? Probably mm, not. I mean, not it's, yet. No, <laughs> you're, you're probably less likely because you don't know if I'm referable. That's the thing. You got to be referable. Right. So I, I'm using that as an example. Not that it's, it's all bad. Like some people don't even call you. You really have to call. But let's talk about a five step process that our mortgage pros can implement. And I'm going to go deep on the why for each piece. Okay. So you absolutely want to make sure that you're talking about why you're calling, which hence like, Hey, we have a mutual client, Zach. Um, I also believe though, that you should be speaking about how we'll be communicating. I also think that we should be talking about and pulling, pulling this from the real estate agent. What is important from their aspect of the transaction? I would like to talk about accountability and flexibility because remember I told my client Zach that I wanted him to say that to Christine. I'm not going to assume I want to do that myself. And then this is the piece that I think is, is missing most often is the follow-up actually establishing a date of next conversation. It's not always going to be doable. It's not going to convert hundred percent of the time, but it really is impactful. And if I, I could take three minutes, Christine, and give a show as to what this could sound like. Um, do you mind playing again, being the role of uh, the real estate professional? Yes, let's do it. As again. you were in a past life? Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so ring, ring. Hi, this is Christine. Hey, Christine, this is Mike Bud calling from Bud's Mortgages. I'm giving you a phone call because I'm, we're working with a mutual client, Zach. He's a okay. client that I'm working with, and uh, he gave me your contact information. I wanted to call to introduce myself to you. Um, so how are you? I'm I'm doing good today. Thank you. Good. That's very good. Now, um, you know, I, I did want to make sure that I was on the same page with you. Um, it is important communication in our business. So this is the number that Zach gave me. But if an emergency or in a way that we need to communicate, is this the best number to reach you at? Well, I would probably prefer you call me. This is my office line. I want to call me on my cell. That would be better. Okay, no problem. What's your cell phone number? 313-555-1212. One, two, one, two. Okay, the cell phone. Yes. Um, great. Is there anything else that I need to be aware of when communicating with you? I do turn my phone off. Like after 10 o'clock, I'm, I'm, I turn my phone off just to spend time with my family. Family time. I can respect that. Family time after 10 o'clock. Not a problem at all. Yes. Um, I'll, I'll share this with you. Thanks for, you know, for letting me know about that. Um, the turning the phone off at 10. Um, can I give you my cell phone number? I do think it's important you have access and access as soon as possible to the person that's working on the mortgage side of things. Do you have a pen and paper? I Let me grab a pen. Yes. May I provide that number to you? Sure. Wonderful. Okay. My phone number is, uh, this is my cell phone. It's 
995-5500. Okay, perfect. Now, I can tell you that, like, for my business, sometimes it's super busy. I'll be in meetings probably just like you are. So if you ever call me and I'm not able to answer, I'm telling you, if you text message me, I am so fast via text that it's going to blow your mind. So please feel free to text me. Always call because I love to talk on the phone. But if you need anything, feel free to text message me, okay? Okay. Wonderful. Now, um, the other thing that I wanted to do here, and I'm showing the group number three here, let's move on to number three, is I don't want to assume anything. Uh, it's rare that I get an opportunity to work with a new real estate agent, and I really enjoy building relationships with a real estate professional. So can you tell me what's important to you as a real estate agent? I think for all involved, really meeting that closing date is probably going to be my most important thing. Now, I'm That's first and foremost. We want to make sure we're able to close. It's a lot riding on this transaction. Okay. What else? That's good, ACD. Um, other than that, if if there's something wrong, if something happens or comes up, I want to know that. I want to know that ASAP. All right. I'm going to write a note to myself here. ASAP. All right, loop you in ASAP on anything that's going on with the loan. Okay, not a problem, Christine. I can make sure that I do that. Let's focus on the ACD, making sure that we hit that, and then also making sure that we communicate ASAP about the status of the loan. I'm with you on that. Okay, um, a couple of other things just to make sure that you know, you're on the same page with me. I had a good conversation with Zach. Um, I'm happy that he's looking at various things. There's a lot of flexibility in working with Zach. So... That's always a good feeling when, as, as a real estate agent, you're not like, okay, thank God nobody's going to breathe on the loan and it's going to go sideways. Mm -hmm. No. In fact, I'm actually going to be meeting with Zach tomorrow on Friday so that we can, uh, we can review his pay stubs together. And what I was thinking was, I'm going to have the conversation with Zach. Uh, we're going to talk about him from a qualifying standpoint and looking at those flexible options. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, based on what you said with the looping you in on things, I was wondering if I could give you a phone call to give you a quick update after I talk to Zach tomorrow at two o'clock. I would appreciate that. Thank you. Cool. All right. It probably won't be until like three o'clock. I mean, we're going to spend some time together, okay. but I, I will give you a call for sure after we're done there. That way uh, you're in the loop on everything that's going on. Okay. Okay. I appreciate Perfect. it. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I will talk to you tomorrow around three o'clock. All right. I'll talk to you then. All right. End scene. Now, whew. That's a long little role play that we have there. <laughs> but the, the things that we're trying to get accomplished in this is to build some rapport, to build some value. And if you've attended our follow-up training, when we talk about the point is to try to get some new news for the other person to pick up the phone and want to listen to you or, or to talk to you. Mm -hmm. I've now provided some sense of, I've got a value add that I'm going to be providing to you after I talk to Zach. Okay. And I didn't go in for any referrals, but what I am hoping, Christine, is that by creating this and then delivering on it tomorrow, giving you an update, your confidence and trust in me goes up. Those are the things that really make me referable for you to work with, with your clients. So great food for thought. Again, even if you take one piece from this, just remember that there's so many things that you can talk to a real estate agent about. Please don't just call and, and say, hey, I just want to let you know, and here's my phone number. Let me know if you have any questions. Now, I didn't, Christine, I want you to be able to weigh in. You were the, the, the real estate agent. What part of the structure is it that really speaks to you? I really love the fact I always wanted to really be kept in the loop. I wanted to, I, I, no news is not necessarily good news. I want to be able to know, <laughs> I wanted to know what was actually happening. Um, I wanted to know that my clients have flexibility. So if something does come up, that there's different options. If they have to put more money down on that home, or if they have to do something slightly different, or do they have the flexibility to be able to do that and still qualify for this loan? Because ultimately, there's so many other people in the transaction that if the deal doesn't go through or meet that anticipated signing date, mm. um, it could be just a loss for so many people involved. Yeah, you said that, and I, we can't see everybody. We can't see you out there, but I know heads are nodding out there like, oh, yeah, no news is not necessarily good.
really good news. Like I need to know what's going on. I want to have my pulse. That's how I run my business. So many partners that I speak to are exactly that way. So it's, it's refreshing to hear like that's actually both sides of the ball. So it's, it's, um, it's kind of reciprocity, you know, as, as Austin would say, that is something that works for both sides of the business. Mm -hmm. All right. Now that's my best Austin impressionation there. Austin, I love you. We're going to go over to number seven. Number seven here is all about eliminating the shopping um, with a client. So here's what I mean by that. It's not about handling the objection when it comes up. These are going to be ways that you can really eliminate the need for people to shop. How do I position myself in talking to the client in a way that makes them think, oh, you know what, I don't know that I, I really should be shopping. I think that I'm confident, I'm comfortable, I'm doing this whole self-discovery and I'm getting good information, I'm engaged. How do I continue that momentum here in number seven and potentially eliminate people looking to shop around? Mm -hmm. So to do this, so again, a little bit unorthodox, Christine, start with asking for permission. So I would start with it, like you're gonna play the role of my client again, is that cool? That is fine. You're a dynamite client, by the way, and real estate Thank professional. You. Thank you. But I would start with asking the question, Christine, may I ask you a question that I ask all of my clients? Sure. Okay, wonderful. Now, just a food for thought on this, which is more important to you as my client? So closing the loan by your anticipated closing date, or maybe like 200, 250, like $500 cash to close difference, which is more important to you? Well, I mean, those are both really really important. Of course, I want to close, but I don't really think I want to have to come with more cash to close than I anticipated. I don't want to spend more money out of pocket. Thank you. As a side note to the group, that's probably what a lot of people are going to say. We all are thinking ACD, but the client's probably going to say the cash to close because I would think the same thing. Now, thank you for being candid with me about that, Christine. I'm going to ask you another question here. When it comes to thinking about this from the homeowner's perspective, the person that's selling their house, or the agent that's representing the person selling their house, which do you think causes them more problems, the cash differential or the anticipated closing date? Definitely the anticipated closing date. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that doesn't mean that they're both not important, right. but I think you're right. And I, I do like that we're talking about it from what's the other side of the table thinking about. So mm -hmm. thank you for going through that with me. Now, now that we're talking about it, can you grab your pen and paper? Because it here's what I understand is that our anticipated closing date is the 14th. Today is the 25th. We've got just about 20 days to get the loan closed. Right, here's what we're gonna, and then I would pivot into. What I just did there was, I brought you full circle. I have you acknowledging the importance of, holy crap, we got 20 days, we're gonna have to get right. this thing closed. But I don't wanna be the one to tell you. Back to the beginning slide. I don't wanna be the person sitting down with the child saying, hey, you can't touch the stove, believe me. Instead, I need the client to be the one going through self-discovery and telling me like, they're probably worried about the ACD, right? Like, uh, they're not going to say ACD clearly. They don't know the acronym, but they're probably worried about the closing date. Right. That's what the client would say. You're absolutely right, Christine. Now I'm going to pose this question again. You're, you're, everybody's thinking about their answers. You are representing the group. So why should we execute on this type of methodology of eliminating that shopping mindset? Really um, align the, the client for the borrower to really self-discover. We talked about that a lot. You want to be able to buy, provide them with information that will help them understand. They're gonna start to see, this is what's working best for me. You've given me valuable information. I really don't want a shot because this is, I, I know that I only have 20 days or I only have 10 days or whatever those that time is, 30 days to get to that closing table. And I need to act now. Definitely, such a better position to be in. As a sales professional, when the client is selling us on why, that's beautiful. There's nothing harder than trying to convince somebody. And it almost feels like, Christine, being in sales so long that the more you push for something, the more resistance naturally happens from a human being, even if it's irrational. 
we irrationally push back because we sense some of that. Mm -hmm. So using the strategy and the tactics of trying to create the discussion around that, leveraging, again, the whole, hey, can I ask you a question that I ask all my clients? Can I get your permission to like share some thoughts with you? Create a discussion. That's good engagement. Yeah. Now, we're going to pivot as we get into the next essential. But before we do that, I'm going to have some real talk with you, Christine. Have you ever had the instance where you've told somebody that, oh, no, I, 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 you know, I got to talk to my spouse or no, 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 I, I need to wait. Have you ever done this just to get off the phone? Full confession, Mike. Yes, I have. I've said that I, I really need to check with my spouse at times when the spouse really didn't exist. But I've said that. <laughs> <laughs> you've done it even when you haven't had a spouse. Like, yes. oh, I want to talk to the spouse. Okay. You're not alone. You're not alone. Like, all of us are nodding our heads going, yeah, yeah. You know, like, that's very, very common. And it's so common that from a, from a sales perspective, we tend to be the ones that go, all right, well, I don't know if this is true or not. Like, I can't tell if it's a smoke screen. Like sometimes we say like, that's a smoke screen and it could, or it may not be, but let's talk about it and go deeper. In a purchase transaction, we need to be able to go deeper, deeper with our clients if we're really going to build that trust and have that self-discovery. So the number eight essential, is all about the weight and spouse objection, but it's about putting our energy into the right place. Now, some of you have been on trainings with us where we talk about sliding scale questions. Huge believer, Christine, in having the sliding scale questions and applying those to really get a better understanding from the client. Now, I'm gonna put some things on the screen here for us, um, and I'm gonna ask you to play the role again of our client. You have provided me with the the you know what? I'm just going to ask you, hit me with an objection, weight or spouse. Doesn't matter to me. You know, I, I'm getting ready to go out of town. So I think I, for just for the weekend. So I think I want to wait. I, I think we'll, I can connect with you on maybe uh, Tuesday or Wednesday of next week. Got it. Not a problem at all. We absolutely can connect again. I'm going to ask you for a second again. You've engaged me with me so well. Um, I'm going to ask you to be 100% candid with me right now. Okay. You're not going to hurt my feelings. Remember, Christine, I work for you, not the other way around. On a scale of one to 10, how do you feel about the figures and all of the flexibility and the options that we discussed today? Remember, I'm, don't tell me what I want to hear. Tell me what I need to know. Yeah, about an eight. About an eight. Okay. Well, that's not too bad. I guess, what do I need to do to really move that closer to a 10? You know, I, I know there's a couple of different options that we talked about, I really want to just focus on maybe reducing that payment a little bit more just in case. Okay. What do you mean? Just in case that's a, like, that's important. I want to better understand it. Yeah. Just in case, you know, of an emergency, you know, I'm spending my money. I know we talked, we talked about a few things, but I don't know if I should be really right now. You showed me some great options. Do I want to save some of the money that I have in my pocket or do I want to reduce the monthly payment? So just a little unsure right now. Fantastic. We're going to stop the the, uh, the role play. I did write down a couple of things. Payment just in case. Emergency. That's what I'm paraphrasing back from what I heard from Christine. This is what the goal is. My goal with providing this essential is not to say this is how you're going to overcome that. I actually don't believe in that anyway, Christina. I don't, I don't, I don't think overcoming things. I think it's about talking through things. And in a case where you went from, you know what, I, I want to wait until next week, Tuesday, I want to try to better understand what the true feelings are. And it's not that I'm saying it was a smoke screen. You truly might want to wait till you get back on Tuesday, but I need to better understand what are the things that are going through your mind. The sliding scale question allows me to do that. Most people are going to give you six, seven, or eight. That's just the way it is. Somebody says nine, the deal's pretty much yours. Somebody says 10, you're writing the loan right there. Right. But either way you go, it's so much better to get that sliding scale number and then go right in and ask, like, all right, well, your experience is important to me. What, what is it that needs to be done here to make your experience a 10? And then the client will open up a little bit. And we're going to come back to this again, but I'm going to transition from this. And, and 
if you don't mind, I know you kind of ad lib that, Christine. We didn't practice the idea yes. of what, how you were going to respond. But going down this path of like, let's say that we were going to get back together on Tuesday. Let's say that mm -hmm. that whole conversation went down the path of Tuesday, we're going to do it. And I said, I'll, I'll put together a couple of options here. I'm going to really break down what the numbers look like. And we're going to go to work. So I'll go to work while you're going on vacation. Okay. And then when you get back here, we're going to go to work together. But there is something that I need from you. That's where we get in essential number nine. Encourage your client to gather docs. Now, what are some of the documents that you could have your client gather up front? What are your thoughts on that, Christine? Well, when I think about that, really income and assets, working with a lot of clients, sometimes they need to gather, they may need to go online, they may need to just download certain documents. So really prepping and preparing for that. And I always try and give them just a format to remember. So they want to get their pay stubs, their W-2s, their bank <laughs> statements. But the question is always, how many of each do you need? So when I think about that, I have the two, two, two analogy here. Oh my goodness. That is a classic. I'm going to put it in the, the chat so everybody can see it. We would say two, two, and two. Like, you're right. Even clients are like, how much or what do you need? A very simple way to remember two years W-2s, two years or two months um, bank statements, and the la the most recent uh, pay stubs. Yes. You know, clearly, if it's something that they work and they get paid weekly, you're going to want to have 30 days worth. However, like, I think the crux of this, though, Christine, is that me having you engage and actually doing something tangible towards the loan, this is really engaging you and pulling you into working with me. Yeah. Um, you know, if, if um, it'll give you a great, a great test as well. If somebody's like, oh yeah, no problem. Like, do you want me to get that to you tonight? What a great indicator that like, hey, you should feel good. Like it really is about waiting till Tuesday. It really is about making sure you go over those numbers that she's on board with moving forward. She's even willing to send me everything. That's a good feeling, right? So I think you win with engagement. That's why we wanted to make sure that you guys know it as number nine. Getting into our last, the the, the home stretch here, number 10. Um, let's bring it onto the screen so that they can see the, the two, two, and two. Yeah. Two most recent pay stubs, two uh, uh, most recent W-2s, and then the two months where the bank statements, all pages, Mortgage pros out there are like, yes, please, even the blank page. You know what that feels like when somebody yes. forgets to send the blank page. <laughs> now, before we get into the last tip here, Christine, let's talk about controlling the messaging. So in this case, you've said this before to me, most people have an influence in their life. Maybe it's their spouse. Maybe it's their parents. Maybe it's their older brother, younger brother, older sister, younger sister, cousin, like whatever. The, anybody people have other people that play a strong role in their lives. When it comes to controlling the messaging, let's talk about this for a second. When we don't control the messaging that's being passed on to that other person, in your own words, what do you think is actually being discussed when that when your client talks to that other person, that advisor? In most cases, they'll probably share the things that made them uncomfortable or maybe the negative things that they found or they heard because a lot of times, sometimes the, the negative things stand out more than the positive because you're already nervous. So you have that fear of <laughs> yeah. what if this happens or what if, you know, I have to come out of pocket more money. So that's probably what they share, even though we had them write down a lot of the um, the positive things that we talked about. So that's why it's really important to really yeah. be able to control those things. Human nature, right? Mm -hmm. Human nature. My wife, Rita, I would do the exact same thing. Like if I were to talk to her, I would say like, hey, so it makes a lot of sense, A, B, and C, but I would absolutely be like, I just don't like this one thing here. Like whatever that is, like that would be my like, hey, I need to talk to you about this because I'm not, I'm concerned with this. And that ultimately can be what scares the other client. And then nobody feels good about that. So you have to control what you can control. And we can't control everything, right? So it's such a an important piece to the sale if you're thinking about it from a how to coach your client. So number 10 is how to sales coach your client. And when we say sales coach, what we're trying to say is how to make sure that you're having your client focus, write things down, and then be very tactical with the messaging. If I have you, if I remind you of a few things as you go through this, Christine, your page might look like stuff everywhere. 
if I say like, you know what, can you grab a new sheet of paper? Let's talk about this. I'm going to have you, I'm going to remind you of a couple things. Um, let me give the frame for this. As you guys see it on the left side of the screen here, again, I'm not about semantics, so you can say it however you'd like to say it, but it would sound something like this. Christine's my client. I would say, real quick, Christine, before I let you off the phone here, um, I wanted to just highlight a couple of key things that we talked about that really stood out to me during our conversation. That way you can pass them along to your parents when you're having that discussion. Is that okay? Yes. Perfect. Okay. Can you be sure to write these down and just write them on a fresh piece of paper here? The first thing is, remember, we've got flexibility and that's a great feeling. You have options, just like you said, with what you want to put down and how you want to move forward with the mortgage. And that's a good feeling. Feel good about that. You've got flexibility for down payment options. Also write this down. Remember we talked about $1,000 equaling $5 a month in payment? We also said that 10,000 is $50 a month. I really believe that when I talk to clients, that helps them really digest and understand that piece of, um, of the fear. Like you were saying, hey, what if an emergency? What about this? Like understanding those concepts will really help. 1,000 equals $5 a month, 10,000 equals $50 a month. And the last thing is just like we had talked about, Closing on time is the most important piece. You and I can figure out every other thing that we need to on the mortgage. But the fact of the matter is the 20th is tick tock, tick tock. And we're coming up on it fast, but we're going to get it done together. So just be mindful. Make sure you write that down. The most important piece is that we close the purchase on time. You want to add anything to that, by the way? Yes, you know, and then I always like to also add, sometimes speaking with clients, of the three things that you just wrote down, which or the things that we talked about today, what mm. was the most valuable for you? What was the most valuable thing that you heard or that you liked or you think that will make your life simpler? And what it does to me, Mike, it really gets them to end that call on really a positive note. So instead mm -hmm. of thinking about that negative, now they're going to share when they talk to their family or their friends. They're going to say, you know, I really, I, Mike really shared some really good information, but he showed me how I can actually save that $9,000 or that $10,000 that I wanted to put down. I don't have to do it now. I can paint that kitchen. Oh, I love that. <laughs> I love that. If somebody says like, well, I like the... I like the, the, what did you call it? LPMI? Like when somebody says something, really the LPMI, why that? Like now I can find out what more, more, like you're an expert at doing that. The more you can uncover, you're bringing all of those good emotions and that self-discovery back up to the surface. So um, let's do a quick review. Christy, okay. let's do a quick review with everybody here. Uh, you're going to answer at home, keep score for yourself. As we go through this, the voice of the people is Christine. We're going to ask you the question. True or false? A sponsor or weight objection is usually not the real objection. What do you think? I will say true. It's usually some type of smoke screen. It's something deeper that they maybe either didn't share with you or um, they, 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 they're the real objection. They just mm -hmm. didn't want, they didn't share it right away. There's something there. Okay. I'll play the other side of the coin. I'll be the devil's advocate and say, like, you know what? Sometimes it is real. Mm -hmm. The goal is to better understand the fears that the client has. So even if it's legit, my job is to try to understand what are the things outside of that spouse or that weight, just like we uncovered. It's the, the payment. What about an emergency? Oh, what do I do? Just in case. Those things are, are ringing through my mind. Um, very good. So either way you answered that, you are right. It's all about going deeper. Next question. True or false? There's usually more than one person involved in a mortgage decision. True. There's usually when, when family or friends know that you're purchasing a home, everyone will get involved. Everyone will give their opinion. So mm. usually that could be that person that you trust. They're going to chime in and give you their thoughts of what happened when they purchased their home 30 years ago. Yes. Uh, now we're, we've got one more question and I know we've got about four minutes left. We will stay on for Q and A. If you have questions, fire them right into the chat, or excuse me, into the Q and A and we'll get those answered. Um, but I, I think you're absolutely right. And in a purchase, everything is so emotional. Of course, they're speaking with other people. 
Now, this question, this is for the entire group. I want you guys to think about this. You've taken a lot of notes. Put a little star on your page next to what you believe the biggest takeaway that you can implement into your business right away is. Whatever that is. You know, maybe it's the call structure of how to like talk to a, a, a real estate professional and how to pull from them what's important from them. Uh, maybe it's some of the things that that you shared with us, Christine. You know, the importance of really breaking things down and the the flexibility and people having options. Whatever it is, make sure you guys write down, put that star next to it because it's one thing for us to talk about it, but it. It has to be implemented for it to be successful and for it to elevate your business. You've got to implement it. So even if you're taking one thing away and you implement it, we consider that a win. We hope that you do as well. We'll now move into the uh, Q and a portion of this. You are going to get a survey and believe me, my all access folks, uh, Chrissy and I were at all access yesterday. Great feedback coming from the group. I have it all written down. We are going to, Okay, team, I think we're going to stop here. Thank you guys for joining us once again. I hope this information was helpful to some of you guys. And if you have any questions or anything, let please let us know. Thanks, Joel. Tequila. Thank you, Joel. Hila, are you there? I, I'm so sorry. I'm eating my lunch right now, but um, 